Hi, my name is Dave Loomis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Regulatory Policy Studies here at Illinois State University. The Institute was founded in 1997 uh, with a threefold purpose to support our master's degree program in electricity, natural gas, and telecommunications economics to do public education and outreach, and to do applied research in public policy matters. As part of our education and outreach mission, we've created these video podcasts. And each month, we're going to sit down with a key policy decision maker in Illinois that helps shape the innovative regulatory environment uh, that we have here in Illinois. So I hope you enjoy each one. Thank you. So you would say that kind of through the 80s and, and mid-90s, it was pretty uh, contentious? Uh, yeah. Well, what happened was we had, we had relatively low rates, um, and nobody really cared much about rates. And then we began to rate base the nuclear plants in the late 60s. And um, the rates had been going down for, you know, 50 years before that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about 1970, they bottomed out and started going up. Um, and uh, we had a series of big rate hikes, mm -hmm. which were getting get a lot of attention and upset a lot of people um, uh, throughout the uh, 70s mm -hmm. and into the 80s. Um, and then CUB was created partly in response to that in 84. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 85, we had the Public Utility Act rewrite. Mm -hmm. And it was a big battle in Springfield. Um, and uh, there was a major change in the way that utilities were regulated, at least in the framework for the regulation. Um, a key change in 85 was the bifurcation of the Commerce Commission, where the staff was made independent of the commission ah. and became a separate party to cases with its own executive director and staff, and it truly became independent mm -hmm. um, and took positions that, that it believed were in the public interest based on the record of evidence and mm -hmm. put up its own witnesses and such as it had, but yeah. without any interference now from the Commerce Commission itself. Mm -hmm. um, they were the judges, but mm -hmm. uh, the staff uh, became an independent party. Okay. That was a big change. Yeah. Um, and there were changes in the, the uh, rules of regulation at the time. Um, I'm not sure I can remember all the, all the uh, <laughs> pre-1985 Public Utility <laughs> Act uh, provisions, but um, one thing that happened is that the uh, utilities uh, no longer could automatically or effectively automatically rate base new plant. Um, they had to prove it up in, in, with, with higher standards mm -hmm. than had been in place before that. Um, and um, that set the stage for a series of court cases down the road, which <laughs> went in consumers' favor mm -hmm. as they tried to, uh, ComEd in particular, tried to rate base, um, well, ComEd was trying to rate base uh, the Braidwood plants were the last ones, and, and okay. of course, uh, Illinois Power at the time, a predecessor company of Ameren, had the Clinton plant, mm -hmm. a single unit plant, its only plant, which it never could quite get, uh, get wrap its arms around, <laughs> um, and which ended up to be, you know, a $450, $450 million initial estimate became a $5 billion plant. Wow. Um, and the same thing was happening with, with, the, with the ComEd plants. Um, so they're like Why? ten times more expensive yes. than the initial the, estimate. The Clinton plant in. came in at twelve times the initial estimate. Wow! Um, when it was finally finished, mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, one could Illinois Power really its its demise as an independent company probably was because of the Clinton plant. Mm -hmm. This predates me. Uh, yeah, I came in right and. 96, 97, so I didn't Well, I came this, in at uh, 85. History. Okay. And mm -hmm. Cub was six months old at the time, and I started as a temp at Cub. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And I, I uh, was an English major in college and um, <laughs> had done many other things uh, having nothing to do with public utility regulation. So everything I know I learned on the job. I spent 20 years at Cub mm -hmm. until one morning when the governor who shall not be named, called me up and said, I want to appoint you to be chairman of the Commerce Commission, which he did in, nine, in uh, 2005. Uh, and I served for seven weeks until I became the first person ever to be denied confirmation. Mm. Uh, still the only person ever to be denied confirmation <laughs> by the state senate. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, shall we say, a pawn in a political game that I didn't quite understand at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you, you know, you make your own choices, and uh, I don't blame anybody for that. But uh, after that, I, I um, worked in state government as a policy advisor to the governor mm -hmm. for two years. Um, another mistake, perhaps. <laughs> but during those two years, we did have some very serious energy policy matters that that crossed my desk that I w that I was working on for the governor and, and uh, the creation of the Illinois Power Agency was the culmination of that in, in 07 mm -hmm. um, and uh, I worked on the response to that legislation um, and, and the governor's implementation of it which I thought went pretty well then mm -hmm. I left mm -hmm. as soon as I could get out <laughs> um, and hung out my own shingle as a consultant mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, six plus years ago so you've been so heavily involved in smart grid issues in the last yes. um, uh, while as a, yes. as a consultant. Yes, you might say I've hit for the cycle. I was a consumer <laughs> advocate for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I uh, was <laughs> chairman of the commission very briefly. <laughs> then I worked in state government mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years. And now as an independent consultant working on environmental and consumer issues, I now have my first utility client mm -hmm. uh, working with ComEd <laughs> to mm -hmm. hope we can all get our oars in the water in the same direction as we deploy smart grid and develop the policy mm -hmm. without, we hope, the kind of uh, acrimony and mm -hmm. uh, contentiousness that has, uh, <laughs> we've seen so often in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, my, that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, so I've, I've, I have a utility client after being, uh, you might say on the other side, but I <laughs> think we've all been on the same side really for a long time in many mm -hmm. ways. The rewrite of the Public Utilities Act, mm -hmm. which bifurcated the Commerce Commission and made the staff independent and changed the regulatory framework in a way that uh, even the scales and made utilities prove uh, their investments in a way that they hadn't done before. And, and what was the logic behind bifurcating the, the commission? Did, was there the sense that commission staff were not independent enough so that the yes. record did not kind of uh, um, show a, you know, a, a balance or a, a, a different uh, viewpoints? The legislature thought, and uh, I think people in the community also thought that the commission was not objective, mm -hmm. that uh, it was easily manipulating the staff to take positions in cases that the commission wanted to see them take, mm -hmm. instead of having the staff professionals use their own good judgment. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, make their case to the commission, have the commission uh, treat them very similar to other parties. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was a good good step. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there were other changes in the act which were then relied upon in cases subsequently which turned out in consumers' favor um, in the courts. Mm -hmm. What happened, uh, I mean there was a whole, there were seven or eight cases actually. Mm -hmm. um, but memorably, um, it was almost Christmas Eve of 1986, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a political deal done outside of the Commerce Commission uh, in which all the political leadership of the state, the governor, the state's attorney of Cook County, in DuPage County, the attorney general, mm -hmm. um, a series of uh, the Speaker of the House, a series of very important leaders all agreed on a regulatory plan to rate base ComEd's remaining nuclear plants, the Braidwood plants, mm. and they said it was going to be the last of the uh, nuclear issues. Once and for all, we were going to have one last rate hike, and that was it. No yeah. more rate basing, mm -hmm. and and the company was supposedly going to take a haircut of some kind on the on the assets, and everybody should be happy. We'll be mm -hmm. done with it because mm -hmm. we've been battling it for 15 years at that point. <laughs> um, there was one notable exception to the support among the political leadership. That was Mayor Harold Washington of the city of Chicago hmm. at the time. Um, he opposed it, mm -hmm. but virtually all the other political leaders did not. They supported mm -hmm. it. The deal was done, um, and then it was brought to the Commerce Commission for its approval. And um, Cub opposed it mm -hmm. uh, at the time, as did uh, some other consumer groups. And lo and behold, the Commerce Commission, on a 4-3 vote, we had a seven-member commission at the time, mm -hmm. they turned it down. Uh, very courageous mm. and um, an embarrassment to a lot of the political leaders who had uh, put this together. Mm -hmm. Then there was a settlement of a case brought to the commission in a, of a different sort, 
which um, resulted in the commission approving it, but then it was taken to court, and then we had a series of court cases in favor of consumers. There was BPI-1, BPI-2, mm -hmm. which are complicated court cases, but essentially saying you can't make a deal to do rates unless you have everybody on board. If you want to have a settlement, mm -hmm. it either has to be with everybody agreeing to it, or it has to be based on a record of evidence. Mm -hmm. You can't have a contested settlement that doesn't have a record of evidence to support it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the courts threw out a, a big rate hike mm -hmm. on that basis, and then threw out another one on another basis. And uh, over a period of years, we had a series of cases. In 1993, we began uh, to talk to ComEd about settling these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Howard Lerner, who was uh, attorney at BPI at the time, mm -hmm. before he headed up, uh, founded Environmental Law and Policy Center, he was a cru the, the key negotiator, uh, mm -hmm. really. We had a massive, major, multi-party, uh, multi-case settlement in 1993. Mm -hmm. And it resulted, as part of the agreement, in a $1.39 billion refund to consumers wow. and a $300 plus million dollar rate cut. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the per period of 1994, Electricity in Illinois was on sale, and it was 25 percent <laughs> off for mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. to pay back consumers uh, what had been settled upon. Mm -hmm. And then rates were lower. And then there was another rate case again in '95, a contentious rate case. Um, now we're getting close to '97. Mm -hmm. By '97, everybody was pretty fed up with the regulatory system. But but it sounds like. Um Cub and consumers were kind of winning in the, in that uh, in uh, the court system. Cub was winning in the court system, but you know what? The rates were still still among so the highest, uh, even though even, they were even lower after than they those been. big cuts. Well, they uh, were they uh, were they were lower than they had been, mm -hmm. and they were coming back down relative to others. But the rates were still very high for ComEd and and Illinois Power, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, there was talk of competition in the air, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed like a good idea, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, especially to some of us who had saw the failures of, of regulation attempting to mm, present itself as, as, as if it were competition. That is <laughs> the way regulation is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. You create the conditions as if there were a competitive market and the same sorts of uh, uh, result is what you want. Mm -hmm. but it, it's not the same thing as having an actual competitive market, and, and it never quite works that way. So when it became, you know, uh, obvious that perhaps there were some, well, it wasn't obvious to everybody, but <laughs> um, it appeared that the utility, the hundred-year-old natural monopoly was not so natural, mm -hmm. that there were elements of it that could be subject to competition and all the efficiencies that might bring. Uh, a lot of people began to say, well, why don't we try that? Yeah. It, it had been tried a few places, yeah. um, but not for very long. Mm -hmm. So um, we sat down to negotiate something in 97, and um, Cub supported the idea of restructuring. Mm -hmm. And so did ComEd, or Unicom mm -hmm. at the time, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, Illinois Power, and uh, CIPS, and uh, Silco, the, the companies that uh, came together under the Ameren brand eventually. And there were many other parties to these discussions, but there were ground rules laid out by the legislative leaders at the outset. Mm -hmm. And there were three of them. Mm -hmm. One was that there will be a major rate cut for consumers when we're all done as part of this deal. Mm -hmm. Two, there will be no requirement that utilities have to divest their generation assets. That mm -hmm. will be voluntary. We're not going to have mandatory restructuring of the companies. And three, there will be stranded cost recovery if they do decide to move their assets. Those were the only three rules. And, and we were and told to negotiate everything else. And, and the thinking was, in terms of the stranded costs at the time, was that the nuclear assets were um, we're only running 45, 50 percent their capacity factor uh, was, and, and right. that those were going to be uneconomic in this new competitive environment. So 
um, at least uh, at what they were on the books. Um, yes, uh, yes, then. absolutely. The, the um, nuclear plants were seen perhaps as white elephants. Mm -hmm. They certainly uh, were not valued in the marketplace at the time um, at their book value. Mm -hmm. And so somebody was going to have to eat significant costs. Mm -hmm. So um, this whole stranded cost framework was negotiated, and it became a stranded revenue not stranded costs that were recovered, different from the way other states did it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the utilities who would lose customers were owed a portion of the savings back for a period of time as lost revenue. Yeah. Um, how that affected their actual ability to uh, write down costs was their own business. Mm -hmm. So they collected extra revenue for customers that left. And of course, in the early years, it was only the largest customers leaving. Um, and that was supposed to make them whole. But they did after restructuring, and ComEd, of course, moved its nuclear plants to a, an affiliate, mm -hmm. sold off its coal plants and most of the gas plants. Um, and, and, and that was a surprising move in and of itself because uh, you would think, I mean, uh, from the outside, that at the time, the coal assets were the ones that were going to be economic and, and the nuclear were the ones that were uneconomic. So. But as you say, in the marketplace, nuclear wasn't valued very highly. So Correct. if they did sell those off, they weren't going to get much they for were, them. If they weren't uh, going to get much for the nuclear plants. They were. Uh, they had been running very poorly, mm -hmm. and uh, had very low capacity factors. Mm -hmm. um, series of malfunctions and shutdowns and safety issues, and uh, nobody wanted those plants yeah. at the time. Nuclear was thought to be a dying industry. Mm -hmm. but the coal plants running cheaply and efficiently were thought to be uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 mm, the golden eggs that they, they owned. Okay. Um, and they got a good price for those coal plants. They got more for the coal plants when they sold them than anybody thought they would. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, the company that bought them, uh, eventually, I, if they didn't regret it, they, their shareholders <laughs> probably did because yeah. it turned out that their coal was not the way to go. And, and uh, Exelon formed, and they, their bet was on nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for a long time, that looked like a pretty good bet. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. It's still always in flux, but um, <laughs> probably uh, they they you know they came out uh, smelling like a rose. Certainly at the time. I mean, we had a uh, you know remember that the part of the deal in '97 was a a rate cut that was 20 percent for residential customers and locked in mm -hmm. for nine years. Um, it, but uh, it didn't start <laughs> there, right? I mean, it was something more, it was, I, I, I remember it being 15%. The rate cut that was originally agreed to was 15%. It became mm -hmm. 20%. Why did that happen? Largely because yeah. Senate President Pate Phillip said it would. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. There was no magic about any of the numbers. Mm -hmm. But um, Pate Phillip, I think, I, I would give him the credit. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody who doesn't often get a lot of credit in these discussions as we re remember back how it happened. But I, I think it was it was his doing that the 15 became 20 percent rate cut. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think what one thing that happened is we were proven right. The we'd been saying for decades that the nuclear plants had been poorly run um, and uh, were just burning up customers' money. Mm -hmm. well, lo and behold, once they were deregulated, the <laughs> capacity factors went from 45, 50 percent to 90, 95, 97 percent. Yeah. So it was possible to run them better, and when the incentives were in place to do so, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So you had uh, ComEd and uh, uh, Ameren now um, making money on the nuclear plants, making being profitable as, as companies, even though they had a huge rate cut that was offered to customers and, and put in place and held there for the better part of a decade. So mm -hmm. uh, there were powerful inefficiencies in those companies that, that were uh, kind of uh, squeezed out mm -hmm. by the restructuring. And they're much more efficient companies today. Mm -hmm. And the rates that we are paying show that. And it seemed like with the uh, combination of Commonwealth Edison and, and Pico that, that uh, there was some expertise in running nuclear power plants that, that from my outsider point
point of view, seemed to yeah. be better run on the PICO side and had some folks that kind of figured out the secret sauce yeah. of how to do training and how to get them, sure. you know, standardized right. and, and uh, procedures that, for whatever reason, uh, did not Well, back in the 60s, happen. 70s, every utility wanted to have a nuke. That was mm -hmm. considered, you know, how you got to be one of the big boy utilities. You better mm -hmm. have a nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. And it was some, some people considered it their patriotic duty to have a nuclear plant, Adams mm -hmm. for Peace. You know, that was how it all started. Mm -hmm. it was, that was how it was pitched. Um, but it turns out that no, no company can run a singular, single nuclear plant very successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, all the companies that had one plant, almost all of them, did it poorly because there's a yeah. whole set of expertise and synergies and uh, to, to running nuclear plants. It turns out uh, you're much better off if you have a whole phalanx of them that you yeah. can run in, in a systematic way and there are a lot of efficiencies in doing so. And I think uh, Exelon saw that and began to gather up, you know, a couple dozen nukes that mm -hmm. they own or operate now. Um, and um, Illinois Power, you know, predecessor to Amlin saw that and they gave up their lone nuclear plant, mm -hmm. which was a basket case at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. But but it, it uh, yeah, it was it was. Uh, the idea that every utility was going to have a nuclear plant or all the big ones would have their own, you know, that, that just didn't work out very well. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. You know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still early. <laughs> so besides um, the nuclear power plant um, and the kind of the regulatory climate, were there factors that led to an agreement that led to uh, an actual enactment of of uh, law. Hmm. It seems like those are all factors that pushed us to do something, but not necessarily for everybody to kind of give and take and come up with a, yeah. a solution. There was something in the air moving toward restructuring. It was the big buzz in the whole industry at the time. Mm. It was before the California meltdown and before mm -hmm. Enron and before mm -hmm. all the problems that, that happened several years later were, were known. Mm -hmm. And as a theory, competition sure made a lot of sense. Turned out, like most things, when you put it in practice, it's a lot harder to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was some momentum for it. Um, everybody was unhappy. Um, at the same time as consumers thought that the Commerce Commission was in the hip pocket of the utilities, um, the utility trade magazines would give Illinois ranking as one of the worst regulatory climates for utilities. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, could both sides be right? <laughs> uh, maybe mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in the battle days in the 80s, I think the fix was in. Mm -hmm. But it certainly wasn't mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And the courts in Illinois weren't putting up with it. So I think uh, the utilities certainly had good reason to want to, you know, maximize the value of their assets. And they thought that on a market uh, they could mm -hmm. um, because they believed their generation assets would have great value. and and. Uh, well, too early to tell whether they were right or not. Really, it's only been 16 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and consumers, at least consumers led by Cub, wanted mm -hmm. change as well because mm -hmm. we saw no way to change the regulatory framework within it to get the rate cuts that we thought were needed to bring rates down to a reasonable level. Mm -hmm. uh, the 20 percent rate cut locked in for nine years that was won as part of the negotiations in the 97 Act. That was absolutely impossible to do mm -hmm. any other way. You could mm -hmm. not do it through the regulatory system. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, there was good incentives on all sides to try to come to an agreement, although there was, of course, opposition to that agreement. It was not universally approved, um, not even by the utility companies. Mm -hmm. um, one of them opposed it. Silco opposed mm -hmm. it vehemently. A number but of consumers. They groups. had some of the lowest rates. Uh, I think, yes. Um, of the they had low rates, utilities. and they and they, they, they didn't want to see a straight of cost recovery. They they they, um, they were all for uh, deregulation as long as they could use their low cost assets to compete, mm -hmm. and they thought that they couldn't um, the way it was being framed, at least not for a no good number of years. Mm -hmm. um, there was opposition from some environmental groups. Didn't think that it had enough uh, pro environment provisions. Mm -hmm. Um, and some 
uh, consumer groups other than Cub opposed it, um, believing that it, it was uh, going to uh, result in higher rates over time because of the deregulation of the generation side. Mm -hmm. There were all good uh, principled reasons to oppose it mm -hmm. um, and some good reasons to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, a deal was eventually struck. It wasn't immediate. Remember that the uh, there was a this was in the spring of '96. There was a bill that uh, finally failed um, after it looked like it was going to pass, and we were sent back to the drawing boards <laughs> to negotiate all summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was hard to keep everybody still focused on having a deal which finally was made and then passed, but still with great controversy and significant opposition in, in uh, the veto session of 97. Do you remember what the difference was between the bill that failed and the bill that um, uh, actually became law? What, what, were, uh, what changed that made it go through? I don't think there was too much change, but I, I think that's when the 15 percent became 20. Okay, so um, squeeze a little bit that's more in terms of rate reduction. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the, the stranded cost formula was somewhat different. I wish I could remember. So it wasn't a major changes, it was tweaks on the already existing there were, framework. To there were tweaks to the framework, Okay. yes. Knowing what you kind of know now, um, um, Given the the give and take, do you think the ninety seven act was kind of on on balance the 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 best uh, uh, that was going to be struck at the at the time, or do you have uh, any regrets as you look back uh, on things? I am often asked, well, not often. <laughs> I'm occasionally asked whether I have regrets about the restructuring and supporting it. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, it's too early to tell. Mm. It's only been 16 years. Mm -hmm. We had a different regulatory structure in place for 75 years. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so far, so good. I think uh, we have seen great benefits from competition. Um, and uh, there have been you know, a few bumps in the road, as we could expect, and there will be more in the future. Mm -hmm. But we really are just now entering a new era with uh, smart grid deployment. Uh, that, that will provide new opportunities and pitfalls as mm -hmm. customers can truly access the, the competitive market in ways that they haven't before. We've had an era uh, in the last five years of very low wholesale energy rates, energy mm -hmm. prices, uh, because of an economic collapse and because of an energy glut. Mm -hmm. and those are not unrelated. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, natural gas prices being very low, historically low, mm -hmm. um, because of both new supply from fracking and other other methods, and and uh, and lower demand, and uh, energy efficiency is playing a part, an important part, and uh, the renewable resource standards, which are causing new generation to be built, wind mm -hmm. and solar primarily. Uh, that that's all having an effect, and and that all having a positive effect. Mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, prices, from the consumer's point of view anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, so right now it looks pretty good, but uh, you know, you, competitive markets mean that when there's scarcity, prices go up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've not had scarcity uh, since these markets came into being. Mm -hmm. So will we see future price spikes? Yes, we will. If I knew mm -hmm. when they'd be, I wouldn't have to work for a living. <laughs> but we will see higher prices. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how are we going to respond to them? And will markets, and now the physical hedge mm -hmm. of energy management, be able to make it a, a, a pleasant voyage for consumers down the road as, as we see prices go up? There are any number of reasons why prices may go up, and almost certainly will go up. Yeah. Um, because there will be periods of shortage. Um, we could have those periods starting tomorrow if there were, for example, a, a, a nuclear plant malfunction and it turns out that uh, all the uh, Westinghouse nuclear plants have some kind of a flaw that needs to be looked at and they have to shut them down to fix mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happens to your markets then when suddenly there's a shortage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or or, or um, uh, we could have, as I think we will have eventually, when we get our heads on straight and begin to address carbon 
issues sensibly, we will have a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. Someday we will. It's the only way to address it with a market mechanism that will raise prices. Although, of course, you can rebate to consumers in ways that make it painless to them. But um, the marginal prices for electricity when coal plants are on the margin will go up. Yeah. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, those things are going to happen. We're not going to have low energy prices forever. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that the, the system we have in place, which is uh, market-based on the energy side, as well as uh, the, the, the physical hedges that we are developing for people to man manage uh, their, their demand, um, and hopefully eventually storage added to the mix, as mm -hmm. well as distributed generation in a much bigger way, uh, that all should enable us to uh, address these uh, periods of scarcity, which which are happen in every market. Yeah, um, I don't know when that'll be. It doesn't <laughs> look like it's going to be soon, mm -hmm. but it will happen. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I hope we're ready for it when it does. Well, let's turn to the to the end of the rate freeze, and we had um, the reverse auction that uh, then resulted in uh, very high prices. Um, there was uh, um, just, you know, headline after headline of uh, kind of rate shock of people uh, yeah. seeing, um, you know, these uh, rates frozen and then in some cases, especially for electric heating customers, um, their rates uh, uh, going through the roof um, and a big mm -hmm. uh, outcry to, to do something and that seemed li like a... Um, kind of a, uh, one of those critical moments to say, okay, w what are we going to do um, uh, here? Are we going to move um, backwards? Are we going to move forwards yeah. as far as uh, competition? How do we solve mm -hmm. um, uh, the crisis in that? Well, in 97, a lot of thought was given to the transition period to negotiate our way through a restructuring, an inter-competitive market-based system. Very little thought was given to what happens at the end <laughs> of this nine-year rate freeze. Yeah. We just weren't looking that far down the road. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty hard to do that. We just weren't prescient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, of course, looking backwards, we can see now that, well, we should have expected a big rate spike, perhaps, mm -hmm. after nine years of rate freeze. But uh, consumers weren't expecting that. Mm -hmm. They weren't ready for it. Uh, and and uh, it happened. Mm -hmm. There was a big rate increase um, and uh, an outcry over that, particularly because of the way that it had been implemented. Mm -hmm. When we went from the regulated, because remember the rates were still regulated, generation had been deregulated, mm -hmm. and we had competitive market, but the retail rates through these long-term contracts of the utilities essentially with their sister companies that were the generation owners had, had uh, locked in these, these low rates. And um, when they ended, mm, they changed the rate design as well. And so although everybody saw significant rate hikes, uh, electric space heaters, residential customers with electric heat, particularly those in the uh, downstate areas that uh, was Ameren's territory, um, they saw huge increases. Mm -hmm. Um, because they had subsidized rates prior to that, or they had below average rates mm -hmm. um, that were guaranteed to them, and now they were paying market rates. And uh, they, there were people who had their winter heat bills triple mm -hmm. um, overnight. And so there was an outcry, and there was clearly a problem in the way that it had been implemented. Um, and then the, the process began ag again, different legislature, <laughs> different set of issues, mm -hmm. but sort of now what are we going to do? Because right. uh, rates had to be brought in line with consumers' demands, um, but utilities had their own uh, needs and prerogatives, so uh, there was a new negotiation uh, to uh, figure out a way through that. Mm -hmm. um, and the Illinois Power Agency is what was created as part of that 07 legislation, which also then reduced rates. Mm -hmm. um, that that bill was negotiated uh, among 
a smaller group than the large, very large group that negotiated the 97 restructuring. Mm -hmm. In 97, we had a, a big room in the uh, uh, state, the building across the street from the, from the Capitol, uh, what's it, the Howlett Building. Mm -hmm. A big room with, you know, giant tables. We had 40 people around, maybe more than that at times, mm -hmm. um, these negotiations. Mm -hmm. It was quite different in, in, in 07, and um, I mean, uh, I was working in the governor's office then, and there, because of political battles between the governor and the speaker and the attorney general, <laughs> um, it was impossible to work together mm -hmm. to develop that bill. Um, and it was largely developed in discussions between the speaker and the, his people and the attorney general. and. Uh, the Senate president, mm -hmm. and uh, and presumably the utility companies, <laughs> um, and 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 uh, uh, it was a much smaller group. Mm -hmm. um, I think Cub had something to do with that, but I was not involved with Cub at that time, so mm -hmm. um, I wasn't I wasn't really party to the negotiations over over that bill. Mm -hmm. But um, I was then on behalf of the governor, very active at the end. Uh, when, when that when that bill was uh, finally put together mm -hmm. and brought to the governor, it seemed like because you know because of these rate increases and the and the outcry that uh, and maybe maybe that was the reason for a, a smaller group. Um, it seemed like it got enacted faster. Reducing rates was considered an urgent matter that had to be done in that summer of 07 mm -hmm. um, because nobody wanted to face another winter with those <laughs> high rates in place mm -hmm. for the winter uh, space heaters. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there was some urgency around getting it done then. Part of that negotiation involved uh, long-term contracts between mm, the Illinois Power Agency or, well, long-term contracts between the utilities and their sister companies for generation. Mm -hmm. Not terribly unlike what happened in 97, we had long-term contracts as, as part of that. Yeah. But those were just guaranteed prices. These were actually long-term contracts for baseload power mm -hmm. uh, signed by ComEd with Exelon and by uh, the, the um, Ameren companies with Ameren to provide uh, baseload power, lots of it, for a mm -hmm. long time. Those contracts have just recently expired mm -hmm. um, in, in the spring of 13. And it, it turns out that they, those contracts were signed at a time of uh, peak power prices. Prices, uh, if you look at a line of, uh, of baseload power prices in the market, you, they peaked right when those <laughs> prices, when those contracts were signed. So they were underwater almost immediately, and then when the economic downturn happened in 08, mm -hmm. uh, energy market prices dropped precipitously, and those contracts were in place um, for another five years. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they were very far underwater. Mm -hmm. um, so whose fault was that? Well, nobody's ever assessed blame. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, for political leaders to negotiate power contracts, you know, pretty tough thing to do if they're probably in the wrong business if, uh, if they're good at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we ended up uh, with higher prices over time than we would have um, without those contracts. Right. But who was to know that we would have an economic collapse in power prices right. plummeting? Mm -hmm. It seemed like a good idea at the time right. to lock in power prices. And they were locked in at a price that was slightly below the market at the time, so it didn't and appear to be a good deal, and it was it was lower, at least than um, than what we had gotten through the reverse auction. So in hindsight, it looked like oh, I mean there was a billion dollar um, a rate cut a, as part of the yes, there was a billion uh, dollar there was a billion dollar rate cut, which was very important. Mm -hmm. um, but remember that the auction was uh, this this uh, full requirements reverse auction, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the power contracts were for baseload power, uh, mm -hmm. uh, very mm -hmm. different animal. animals. Yes. 
So not really comparable. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, if any of us could forecast markets, uh, we wouldn't have to work for a living. And, <laughs> and so it's hard to blame anybody for signing contracts that at the time appeared to be a good deal because in fact they were below market. It just happens that it was at the peak of, of a long-term rise in market prices. And they really came down pretty quickly after that, the next two years, and uh, have stayed down mm -hmm. since then. Um, but those contracts are over now. Mm -hmm. but, 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 the, um, but the, the, the 2007 law put in place a new structure for power procurement, which I think is, is going to serve Illinois well and so far has. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me, I think it would be useful to describe it this way. Um, Illinois is unique among all states in the opportunities for customers to purchase power, market-derived power in different ways. First of all, you can go to the Illinois Power Agency procurement process through your utility. In fact, if you do nothing, that's what you get. You get power purchased in a competitive market and hedged uh, and approved by the Commerce Commission in a plan executed by utility companies, and uh, it's competitive. You don't have to mm -hmm. do anything at all. Mm -hmm. That's a, not a bad way to start. Then you have the option to be part of a municipal aggregation. Eighty percent of customers have cities that have agreed to have municipal auctions for power on various terms. But again, you're getting competitively sourced power through your municipality. Um, and then we have a competitive retail market. Mm -hmm. As an individual, you can go out there and buy power uh, from a whole range of suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, buyer beware, you better know what you're doing, <coughs> but there are some good deals and some bad ones. But mm -hmm. that's a great opportunity mm -hmm. in a retail market. And finally, uh, under the law, you have the opportunity to purchase directly from the wholesale market. All customers do. We have real-time pricing, mm -hmm. hourly pricing for all customers. So residential customers can go call combat and say, I want real-time pricing, and you have hourly pricing at the wholesale market level. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, most people I know who really understand this do. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it has proven partially because market prices have been so low uh, relative to those, those other options, but also because you can moderate your usage at times of high prices in order to save mm -hmm. money. And the fact that prices are uh, low, very low, 95% mm -hmm. of the time, Mm -hmm. uh, means that uh, most customers, the overwhelming majority, can save money when they have hourly market-based pricing. Mm -hmm. um, and residential customers have saved enormously, but fewer than 1% have chosen that option because nobody understands it. <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. going to change over time. Mm -hmm. There's been some studies that have looked at, at um, people not only understanding the prices, but how much um, electricity that consume um, and so I think as we move towards smart grid where people get more familiar with the units of consumption and what the, you know how many uh, um, kilowatts they're consuming this hour and then what that means and you know then then you multiply that by a price and say oh okay that's what it's costing me this hour uh, of things and seeing the variation. Mm -hmm. You see the variation in price, but unless you have a quantity usage, it becomes mysterious. And in some cases, once people just um, uh, use, uh, say, the device we, we use, have at the university, the kilowatt, where they can see their uh, consumption of different devices and test that out, just measurement itself causes some people to curtail their usage, regardless of price, because then they, they, they have something to measure it by where they, it's just kind of, sure, uh, you know, invisible, they can't, can't see it. People start with ignorance of electricity that it's rather profound. <laughs> All they know is they turn the switch, switch yeah. and the light goes on, and at the end of the month they get a bill that they can complain about, but they have to pay it. Yeah. They don't know anything else, most mm -hmm. people. They've never been given any information, yeah. and, and, and they don't get pricing, they don't get usage information in real time, they don't understand it. Why should they? Yeah. And most people don't want to know any of this. Mm -hmm. Their minds are busy <laughs> with other matters more important to them. So right. the trick is going to be to get people to benefit from these opportunities in the market to 
manage their energy in a way that's going to be good for them and save them money and be good for the environment and be good for a more efficient system um, and do so without having to spend uh, a lot of time figuring it out because people aren't willing to do that. Yeah. And it, it is uh, quite perplexing. Uh, I've talked to many people who <laughs> uh, about electricity issues and, and they, you know, their eyes glaze over in a, in a, uh, pretty quickly. Yes. Um, the the long-term task is to make the system more efficient and make people participants in it without them having to have uh, advanced degrees uh, or, or even special equipment. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to need something, but we've got to make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I think I think we will. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the goals of the whole smart grid deployment. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about uh, the so-called smart grid bill, the uh, Energy Modernization um, Act? Because mm -hmm. that seemed to be kind of our next big milestone here in terms right. of from the Restructuring Act, IPA Act, a and we seem to have, you know, th th righted the ship, and things are kind of calm with the IPA Act and all. Right. Uh, not all of a sudden, but but then along comes the the um, um, smart grid bill. Yeah. What well, what was kind of the the push to get that done? Well, smart grid. The technology itself is a challenge to the old regulatory paradigm um, because it's different from what we've had before in a fundamental way. Um, it used to be that a utility have an obligation still does, an obligation to provide reliable service at lowest cost. That's pretty much it. We've added environmentally sound reliable service <laughs> at, at, at lowest cost. Mm -hmm. um, but um, where does smart grid fit into that? What the utilities said when this technology came along is this is good technology, and consumers, certainly those at Cub and, and others in, in Illinois agreed, you know, this would be very helpful to customers to have, to have this in place. Um, but the utility said, well, we, we don't want to be at risk for making investments in this. Um, and so we need to be assured that we're going to recover our investment mm -hmm. and make a return on it. Otherwise, we don't, we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's really never been another kind of investment the utilities have made which is optional. <laughs> uh, they mm -hmm. have to put in transmission distribution Mm -hmm. They have to have uh, generation or contracts per generation. Mm -hmm. They have to have reserve margins. They have to have reliable service to certain standards. And, and, they, and they've done everything um, to, to uh, mm, meet the reasonable standards of service that they're required to meet. Mm -hmm. They've said all along, smart grid isn't part of that. We can provide reliable service at least cost, and we don't need to have smart grid. We can keep going with the same old analog meters we've always had and the meter readers run out to your house every month and you got to call the power company when the power goes out because they have no idea if it went out mm -hmm. and the voltage oscillates more than it should and we put in too much electricity into the system to make sure that we have uh, sufficient <laughs> uh, amounts at the end of the line uh, and the line losses are are large but uh, you know we don't have the controls in place to to uh, to monitor that and, and make it more efficient I mean they, they've, they've said if you don't want it to be a smarter grid we can go along with the old one mm -hmm and everything will be fine. And if you do want it to be smarter, and that's going to be beneficial to customers and to the system as a whole, um, then you've got to pay for it. Yeah. And we don't want to be at risk for these investments, which uh, are going to benefit customers, allow them to use less of our product eventually. <laughs> um, and you know, we want to at least be assured that we're going to be making a reasonable return on the investment. That was mm -hmm. the utility's point of view. Yeah. On the other side, the regulators and uh, consumers uh, said, well, wait a minute, this investment should be subject to the same standards that other investment is. Mm -hmm. And you should uh, look at it in the context of overall investment. It shouldn't be treated as a special category of investment that automatically gets a return. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it ought to be part of the rate base like everything else. And if you make good investments and uh, uh, you are efficient in your operations, you will recover and earn a return on the investment. You are not at risk except for your own decisions. Mm -hmm. And if they're bad ones, then you should be at risk. So that was the, that was the 
battle that's an age old battle really and how do formula rates uh, fold into that as part of the this uh, modernization and the, the well the, the formula rate uh, essentially says that the company is going to still have a rate case um, on an annual basis but it will be uh, one that uh, uh, assures them a particular rate of return on the investment they make uh, provided they haven't massively mismanaged it. I mean, there are still some standards in place, but mm -hmm. but they're essentially automatically And, and in the old rate right cases, that used to be a big contentious part that you would argue at Cub right. towards a, a low end of the cost of capital range. And right. of course, the companies would come in, and that could be like, you know, half a rate case was Correct. talking about the their um, cost of capital is no longer going to be a major issue because it's been set in law mm -hmm. and that was always a huge contentious issue in, in a rate case so that that's changed that, and that, that has certainly stripped regulators of their authority over that particular element mm -hmm. they still have other authority over other elements and uh, uh, we still need good honest hard-working smart regulators mm -hmm. uh, for a whole range of reasons um, but their role in setting the rates has been reduced mm -hmm. when it comes to electricity for these uh, largest of the utility companies. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. And um, that was the deal. Mm -hmm. Utilities said, if you want us to put in this technology, <laughs> mm -hmm. then you have to allow us without protracted rate cases and legal battles in court uh, to be assured that we will recover these costs. Mm -hmm. And now the utilities have essentially won that mm -hmm. fight and the uh, question is, okay, how are we going to deploy this new technology in a way that will benefit customers and make everybody understand that it was worth their money because people are paying higher rates every year to pay for the smart grid. Right. I think it will be worth it. I think uh, it's going to be a, a long road from here to there. Um, but uh, there's no question in my mind that, that this technology has the potential to save customers money and in addition to all the other ancillary benefits such as environmental benefits and benefits for the companies as well making the whole system much more efficient over time um, and more reliable mm -hmm. so I, I I'm very optimistic I've been a smart grid supporter for, for you know a long time in fact as you know I was the a facilitator of the Illinois statewide smart grid collaborative mm -hmm. in 09 and 010 in which we had a giant group grope uh, mm -hmm. among all the stakeholders <laughs> mm -hmm. for a year and a half, probably took longer than it should have, but mm -hmm. uh, we did thoroughly investigate smart grid technology and policy at the time and wrote a 356 page report that I would encourage any student of uh, modern electricity in Illinois to read, <laughs> uh, although uh, maybe you want to read it at bedtime. <laughs> but um, it's an effort that we did in Illinois that hasn't been done elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think it did put everybody on the same page, at least with the same base of information as we start down this road. And as we develop policy now, I think we're in much better shape because we had that collaborative effort. For, say, young entrepreneurs, students that are looking at, at smart grid and, and deploying kind of new technologies, is there kind of a, you know, we talk about smart appliances and mm -hmm. being able to say control that from your iPhone and and uh, you know I, I'm I'm here in Chicago and I could turn on my dishwasher at, at uh, yeah. a home or program it at the middle of the night or say oh if you know electricity prices get below four cents then turn it on um, uh, uh, kinds of things mm -hmm. which um, we're not quite there yet uh, in the smart appliances arena nor have we deployed the, the smart meters uh, uh, to be able to do that, but if you were to look out into the kind of future from a from your experience at Cub, is there kind of a a um, killer app or a future scenario that you see as mm -hmm. being kind of the um, uh, boy that'd be nice uh, to have uh, uh, from a consumer perspective? Yeah, we don't have a killer app yet. I imagine we will, and. Um, what we hope is that it will be an Illinois-based killer app. <laughs> um, and again, Illinois uniquely is trying to develop that. The law putting in place this 
formula rate, the smart grid law, also put in place the Illinois uh, Smart Grid Advisory Council and the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Fund. Those are two very important groups. One, the Smart Grid Advisory Council works on policy. It's a group of stakeholders appointed by legislative and uh, governor, leaders, legislative leaders and the governor. Um, the Smart Grid Advisory Council works with utilities on policy issues. But uh, a sort of sister group, the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Fund is unique. It's a state fund, utility provided money, but it's the people's money mm -hmm. that is going primarily to go into startup companies that are going to try to develop the killer apps of the future mm -hmm. uh, for the smart grid and other energy projects. Um, will we be so fortunate as to, as to uh, be successful with that? I don't know, mm -hmm. um, but there are some exciting projects in the pipeline already having to do with microgrids and uh, uh, a range of technologies that, that show some promise. Um, it's not a lot of money as venture capital goes, but, but uh, these companies are going to be funded at a very early stage, and the legislature mm, told the innovation fund to be self-sustaining and to go out and, and uh, bring more money in, either through uh, leveraging the money in, uh, and getting grants from the federal government, for example, or, uh, but primarily into investing in what we hope eventually profitable ventures to mm -hmm. put more money back in the fund, fund and, and, and reinvest it. Um, that is just now getting off the ground. A couple of investments have been made. Um, at the same time, as there's this $22.5 million fund for investment and also for grants and other ways of, of capitalizing uh, legitimate and needy uh, uh, projects, there's also $5 million a year for 10 years to go into consumer education. Um, and, and that is now just getting underway as well. Um, and that will be invaluable as we uh, attempt to try to help people make sense of what <laughs> this whole smart grid means to them and how it can benefit them and what they, what they can do in mm -hmm. response to it. Um, so so n nobody else is, is doing this in, in, the, in the country in, the, in this way. Hmm. I was appointed to the uh, Smart Grid Advisory Council by Senator Cullerton, Senate President Cullerton, uh, a year and a half ago in March of 2012. And um, then I became elected chairman of the Science and Energy Innovation Fund, mm -hmm. um, which is an offshoot of the Smart Grid Advisory Council. So I, I resigned both posts mm -hmm. when I uh, took on a utility client mm -hmm. because it might be seen as a conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I no longer am involved in that. But I, uh, I know what they do. <laughs> and I have very high hopes mm -hmm. and uh, high expectations. Really top-notch uh, staff and board there. So, mm -hmm. so I think that uh, we're going to do some good things in Illinois that other states are not doing. Anything else that you want to talk about in relation to the smart grid? Smart is really the wrong word. I wish we had a different one for what we call this. Yeah. Smart grid, it both raises false mm -hmm. expectations for people mm -hmm. and it scares them. Mm -hmm. um, what is this smart? I mean, I have something smart in my house. It's like yeah. you know, looking over my shoulder. What? It, it, it <coughs> gives people the mm -hmm. wrong impression. It, it overpromises and it and it raises fears. And and uh, but it's the name we have. It's a catchy one. Mm -hmm. um, but the grid isn't that smart. It just measures things. Mm -hmm. And it and it and it provides information mm -hmm. in real time. Uh, you know, in a network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an overlay of digital intelligence on what has been a very simple transmission distribution grid, but it, it doesn't it doesn't do anything yeah. by itself. It's yeah. not that smart. So mm -hmm. so um, it's going to take a lot of uh, education and new applications and equipment and innovation to make it really work. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that will happen over time. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got to make it a smooth road right at the outset, and that's that's not going to be easy because people don't know anything about this. They don't want to spend any time thinking about it, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, uh, 
people don't trust their utility uh, <laughs> generally, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they're going to be skeptical. Mm -hmm. So we need to address that skepticism and uh, uh, make sure that people understand that this is mm, something that's going to be very beneficial to them right at, right off the bat. Yeah. Um, even if they do nothing, because most people won't do anything, and it'll be a good number of years before enough deployment has taken place that, that we have too many, uh, you know, very many options for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, until we have the um, meter data management systems in place and the protocols so that uh, data provided through the AMI can be accessed uh, easily, efficiently, and uh, with great security, um, and then used for billing purposes uh, by third parties and by the utility and until this is all seamlessly put together, you know, the options uh, for, for how we utilize on the customer side of the meter, uh, the smart grid is, is are limited. Mm -hmm. um, there will be immediate uh, benefits from deployment that people will not see that are going to be good for them. Right. Reliability should improve. Mm -hmm. um, line losses should decline. Unbilled mm -hmm. service should be almost eliminated. Mm -hmm. Estimated bills should be almost eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, meter reading, which is time consuming and expensive, uh, will be eliminated. Uh, but the deployment's going to take eight years. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And so, so uh, until everybody has it, it'll be a long time. Yeah, a and they see the visible benefits that they can then match back to the meter as opposed to the uh, invisible uh, benefits um, that are happening kind of behind the meter, uh, yeah. uh, uh, invisible to them, but, but nevertheless uh, a, a real benefit um, to them. Yeah, yeah. You're an English major. Yes. Uh, did you have any inkling that you would end up uh, doing <laughs> consumer <I> advocacy <laughs> kind of, I mean these are very okay, well, technical issues that yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't, I like <laughs> scare a lot of engineers off. Uh, yeah. uh, no, no, no issues have ever scared me. <laughs> I always felt you can learn anything, mm -hmm. um, put your mind to it. But I wouldn't advise anybody to try my career path. Um, because <laughs> don't 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 go be an English major in order yeah. to. I, yes, I was an English major in college. After college, I did a, a range of things um, that maybe people in their early twenties like to do. I was a roadie <laughs> for a rock and roll band. I, I. Uh, um, I delivered furniture, I drove a cab, I did these sorts of things that uh -huh. a lot of people were doing back then in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I became a potter. Mm -hmm. And I started uh, in 1975 Lill Street Art Center, which is a major art center in Chicago now that I'm still a partner in. Oh. I don't know if you've heard of that place. But no. Yeah. So I, I, with a partner I started that uh, art center. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked in that business, in the art business. Uh, till 1980, and then I decided uh, I didn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I still was uh, an artist, making and selling things, and I was making a living selling ceramic art. Mm -hmm. And then I was also doing political work, mm -hmm. um, mm, progressive, independent politics in Chicago, mm -hmm. and um, I worked on a number of campaigns. And I worked for Harold Washington in '83, full time when he was elected mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I worked for Paul Simon, full time when he was elected to the U.S. Senate in '84. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And it was after I'd done that and worked in, in 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 on those campaigns, and I was really attracted to those campaigns because the men, both of those men, I loved mm -hmm. dearly, and I also really thought that they had the right ideas on policy, mm -hmm. which was my core interest. And so I decided at that point I would stop making art and try to get a job doing public policy in some uh -huh. fashion. And um, Cobb had just started and I applied for a job there and I didn't get the job. Mm -hmm. But uh, a few weeks later Sue Stewart, the first executive director of Cobb, called me and said I need a temp. You, you, you ran a business. I, I said yes, I a small business. I, running a small business for years. Mm -hmm. She said, good, because we need someone to do the bookkeeping here and, and 
some administrative work because our administrator has taken sick and it's going to be out for a couple of weeks and we've got to do the year-end books. This was the end of 84 or something. Mm -hmm. I forget the details, but I said, sure, I'm not, I'll come in <laughs> for a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the couple of weeks turned out the woman had mononucleosis and was out for eight <laughs> weeks. Wow. And I stayed there and then when she came back, I had you know, kind of insinuated myself into the situations <laughs> in a way that they couldn't get rid of me. So I stayed. Uh -huh. And then uh, uh, in about 1990, 91, I became the interim executive director. Mm -hmm. And then 93, I became the full-time executive director. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I learned on the job. Uh -huh. I read. Uh -huh. And I, it's just not that hard if you study. Yeah. Well, That's a good I, message for your students. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was going to say the the uh, the idea of being able to um, learn technical information and read through the filings. I you know that that is something I tell my students all the time. I said you you complain about the reading in school, but your first job, somebody's going to sit you at a desk and give you a three inch three ring binder of some filing and say familiarize yourself with this. And you're gonna, if, if this is the first time you've ever taken a very detailed technical document and had to, you know, without somebody telling you, you know, outline the assignment, these are the things that you need to know, look for this formula, go to page, you know, things, yeah. that's all on you to figure out what's important and what's not important mm -hmm. and not memorize every fact, but put little sticky notes uh, where you need to, oh, here's a key formula, better be able to do that, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, be able to reference it and kind of generally know where stuff stuff is. That's uh, that's a skill that that's yeah. uh, going to become a, a lifetime skill, the, the ability to learn and learn new things and, and surround yourself with smart people who give you good advice uh, um, is key. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really comes down to sorting through the information to figure out what's important and what's not, and 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 remembering it. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know, um, utility regulation has long been an adversarial process, mm -hmm. um, and and that's the part of it that I like the least, uh -huh. um, <laughs> because it seems to me that smart minds should be able to work together to figure out the right solution instead of battling each other. Uh, to try to produce a, a more persuasive case, but yet we've done pretty well with this adversarial <laughs> process, mm -hmm. and 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 I'm not sure that uh, any other process would would really work um, for for a lot of what what we do in regulation. Mm -hmm. But it is it is pretty tough on the witnesses, um, and uh, sometimes it becomes a game of uh, gotcha and uh, mm -hmm. you know mm, attempts to humiliate and. <laughs> embarrassed, <and, laughs> uh, you know, it, it can become, mm, I, I've been a witness, I don't really <laughs> like it too much, I'm, I'm a witness in a couple of cases right now, uh -huh. um, and, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's hard, I mean, and, and the issues are, the technical issues are really hard, I, I'm not a technician, I'm, I'm, I'm a generalist, I'm mm -hmm. a, I'm, uh, you know, uh, and I don't pretend to be a, a, a you know, an accountant, Mm -hmm. uh, or a finance guy, or an engineer, um, or a specialist. I'm a generalist. I'm a policy mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. If there were a student coming out of uh, school um, mm. uh, uh, today, do you, would you encourage them to to move into the um, uh, energy industry? Do you think energy, whether it be on the the regulation side, uh, mm -hmm. DC side, consumer advocate, is this a uh, do you see this as a as a good uh, career path for them to? Uh, well, to I've in? been fascinated by energy ever since I walked in the door at Cub, and uh, continue to find new things every day that fascinate me about it. Um, clearly, energy is the lifeblood of the modern mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we're going to always need more and more of it. Mm -hmm. Yet, because of its environmental consequences, we need to use less and less of it, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we need to produce it more safely and more efficiently, and use it more efficiently, and and, and we need to find a way to store it. I mean, there there, uh, and then we have to have policy in place that is going to uh, both benefit consumers and and allow the 
whole system to uh, nurture itself and, and, and grow as it needs to. Mm -hmm. um, there's a raft of thorny issues, and uh, they change over time, but mm -hmm. the number doesn't diminish, it only grows. Mm -hmm. So I, I would encourage anybody uh, who wants to tackle it to, to, uh, to jump in and find a corner that interests them mm -hmm. and focus on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that there's going to be that much room for sort of ener energy generalists like I've been, <laughs> uh, but there's, there's a lot of good specific places to work. Mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, whether it be engineering or accounting or finance or, um, or policy, but, but um, or many others. Energy law is also a fascinating area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think energy is a great career path. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that uh, our uh, utility yeah. workforce is uh, well-trained, well-educated, uh, um, for uh, certainly in safety of both the public and and uh, for the employees uh, sure. Them sure. themselves. But um, working in the field for mm -hmm. a utility company mm -hmm. is a very demanding, difficult, uh, yet rewarding job mm -hmm. for a highly skilled individual uh, who wants to, you know, be outside. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in all in all the elements. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you know, th th uh, those are good wage, mostly mm -hmm. union jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, once you have a set of skills like that, you know, you can take them wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. and it's a good career. Well, is there anything that I forgot to ask you about? The renewable portfolio standards and the energy efficiency portfolio standards mm -hmm. are uh, growing year by year and becoming more and more important mm -hmm. uh, to the to the whole industry mm -hmm. and the consumer side, the utility side, the producer side, um, and uh, Illinois has made a big commitment uh, to to an expanding set of standards that are really going to, uh, I think, improve uh, life, uh, energy life for, for customers mm -hmm. over, over, over time. Um, we have the uh, solar requirements beginning uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. the solar carve out that, that is, um, should mean a real expansion of uh, rooftop photovoltaics in Illinois. Um, Illinois is a pretty good place for PV. The insulation mm -hmm. uh, in much of the state is, is pretty good. Mm -hmm. So that uh, while we may not be like Germany where I think 20% of their energy is <laughs> solar mm -hmm. or will be, mm -hmm. we, we are going to start heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and um, with that, of course, there's a whole new set of issues around distributed generation. When people have solar roofs um, and um, uh, even distributed wind and eventually storage and electric vehicles, mm -hmm. um, there's a fascinating new set of issues as to, as to how that affects the system and how various costs get apportioned um, and how the benefits are felt. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it will take a while to sort through all that, but I think that as we have a higher and higher percentage of renewables in the mix, there's going to be a greater attention to the issues around that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, Illinois, I think, is in the forefront, maybe not the national leader, but uh, up there in the top ten when it comes to addressing issues of renewables and energy mm -hmm. efficiency mm -hmm. um, and integrating them into the system. And is our rate design such that if, you know, if I, if I put up um, a PV system on my home that generally supplied my needs, not mm -hmm. uh, hour by hour, but, but uh, even up on the, on the whole, does our rate design such that um, our, you know, our fixed monthly charge, our customer charge, recovers the true cost of the line coming out to my house and so forth, 
or are there some of those kind of system-wide costs that we're recovering in uh, the variable rate or well, the electricity rate? Is that there's always been controversy over rate design, and mm -hmm. there always will be. One of the areas of controversy is over the uh, fixed versus variable recovery of of costs. In theory, you recover fixed costs in fixed charges. Mm -hmm variable costs and variable charges, but, but that's not really the way it works. Mm -hmm. And there are actually good reasons why you may not want to do that, because you're trying to send price signals to encourage energy efficiency, for example, and you want to encourage renewable resource development. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we do that through such tactics as net metering, where if you have solar panels on your roof, when the sun is shining, your meter is running backwards, mm -hmm. um, or at least the solar energy is fully offsetting your household usage at that time. Mm -hmm. So essentially you are reducing your bill by the retail rate, um, but the retail rate includes an amount for distribution and transmission. And mm -hmm. So is it a subsidy from other customers when you net meter and are essentially paid the retail rate mm -hmm. for your energy producing? Well. From one perspective, yes, but from another perspective, what about the fact that the sun is shining at noon mm -hmm. when it's 98 degrees out and the <laughs> actual value of that electricity may be five or ten times the retail rate? Mm -hmm. um, are you going to be compensated for that mm -hmm. and how? Well, eventually, the answer is probably yes. Yeah. Um, with a smart grid, you may be. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's social value of to renewables, otherwise we wouldn't subsidize them. Mm -hmm. And so th these are tricky issues as, as to yeah. how you do a uh, rate design. And then when it comes to just the garden variety of distribution uh, cost, how many, how, how do those, mm, how, how, do, how should distribution charges be recovered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you do it uh, in fixed charges, you would have very high fixed monthly charges. And in fact, ComEd does have relatively high fixed monthly charges mm -hmm. based on that theory. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are defensible under uh, all sorts of uh, rate making theories, mm -hmm. uh, 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 cost, cost allocations. But um, if you want to send a price signal to people to reduce their usage, uh, then you want to have volumetric charges that uh, when you reduce your saving right. more than if you have a fixed charge that you can't affect through your energy management. So mm -hmm. there are these kinds of policy trade-offs. Mm -hmm. I'm oversimplifying, of course, because there are a lot of other issues involved in a rate design. Mm -hmm. But um, I find them to be fascinating issues. And <laughs> it's always trade-offs. That's, mm -hmm. that's the nature of it. It's <laughs> yep. always a trade-off. That's yep. what regulation is, is figuring out trade-offs, that's one way to describe what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Optimizing the trade-offs, yep. perhaps. Uh, but um, I, I think rate design is going to become a more and more of an issue as the, the uh, utility policy issue, because as, as the revenue requirement is uh, less and less of an issue because of uh, formula rates and such. Mm -hmm. um, who pays and how they pay uh, is, is going to be more of an issue. Yeah. Um, and there's no right or wrong here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's competing theories and they're different oxes get gored depending <laughs> on how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, but the trick is to figure out a way to do it that everybody benefits. Yeah. And I think yep. that's possible. Yeah. Renewables and, and most likely solar is the best candidate is going to bring a lot of those issues to the forefront. Uh, yeah. As we well, electric vehicles move down there. You know, oh electric yeah. vehicles. We're just at the, <laughs> just at. The, we haven't even hardly scratched the surface of electric vehicles. We have a handful of them, and if you go into the garages around town, they have free spots for electric vehicles or special yeah. spots with you can free charge. That's not going to last for that long once everybody starts uh, to buy them. But mm -hmm. right now, it's you know trying to get the industry off the ground. That's part mm -hmm. of the, the policy, both public and private policy, to support electric vehicles, but they have so much potential and also uh, so much potential, uh, uh, you know, disruption 
mm -hmm. uh, when we start to see high penetrations of electric vehicles. Yeah. What happens when everybody on the block, uh, or when four out of you know mm -hmm. ten people on the block have a, an EV and they plug it in all at the same time? Yeah. Uh, that causes demands that maybe uh, system isn't quite ready for, and, and who pays for the upgrades you need to make sure the distribution system can handle that? Right. That's uh, uh, that's an issue. Um, but you know, when electric vehicles eventually can, through a smart grid, provide energy to the grid when it's needed as these mobile storage units, which whenever they're plugged in could be, um, become power sources for operating the lights yeah. and the air conditioning, um, you know, everybody can benefit from having those EVs at that time, um, not just the owners of them. Right. So, so uh, uh, there are all sorts of infrastructure and policy issues around, around EVs as they evolve mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that that's an area over the next you know decade or more will, will be a fascinating and very interesting mm -hmm. one um, having done this for mm, almost 30 years I understand <laughs> that when you talk about 10 years it's not that long a time yeah mm -hmm. and uh, if, if people say well we're not going to get that benefit for another 10 years you say well that's pretty good <laughs> in 10 years this problem is going to be solved yeah and uh, if you do it right, mm -hmm.